Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our latest vodcast. And this is one that we've not done before. This is the CT evaluation of complications of percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy tubes, PEG tubes. And this was based on an exhibit from Chris Jones and myself. And I thought we'd share this with you because it is an important complication, and hopefully we'll have an article soon about this. But um, let's get started. So. What we're going to do in this talk is review the procedures of PEG and uh, percutaneous endoscopic gastroesophagenostomy, or J2 placement. We'll describe the expected post-procedure positioning and CT findings. We'll discuss uh, the role of imaging for detecting and evaluating suspected or unsuspected complications. And we'll show a um, number of cases which will really help uh, you get an appreciation of what you should be looking for. All of us do see many cases with PEG tubes in place. It's a very common procedure for patients who are at risk for aspiration. It's a common procedure in patients who've had pancreatic masses. There's a number of different reasons. And we're seeing more of these cases, so it's important to know exactly what we should be doing. Now, in terms of placement of gastrostomy tubes, three major techniques, endoscopic placement, radiologic placement on the fluoroscopy or CT or ultrasound guidance, and surgical placement. And these days, endoscopic probably is the most common. Endoscopic or radiology placement is preferred due to shorter procedure time, decreased cost, and decreased complications. And endoscopists are very aggressive on doing these procedures, so they seem to have taken control of that process. Surgical placement is typically reserved for patients undergoing other surgical procedures or with contraindications to endoscopic or radiologic placement, for example, esophageal obstruction, colonic interposition, prior GI surgeries, large gastric varices, obesity, or large volume ascites may all be possibilities. Now, with endoscopic placement, what happens? The endoscope is used to identify the appropriate site for placement in the stomach, which typically is the antrum or mid-body. You don't want to be aiming for the fundus. Transillumination of the selected site through body walls identified by a second operator who confirms the site with finger pressure indenting the stomach. Through a small, less than one centimeter incision, an introducer needle is placed into the stomach. A floppy wire is placed through the needle, snared and pulled through the mouth by the endoscopist, leaving portions of the wire protruding from the abdominal wall incision. The peg is attached to the wire protruding from the mouth and pulled back through the mouth, esophagus and stomach, and finally the abdominal wall. The peg is secured by internal and external bolsters, allowing for one to two centimeters of in and out movement. With radiology placement, fluoroscopy is the way we typically have done it. Insufflation of the stomach with an NG tube but by carbonate granules. The insertion site is typically selected by fluoroscopy and a two centimeter square marked at the insertion site. T fasteners are placed at the four corners of the square, affixing stomach to the abdominal wall. Once secure, an introducer needle is placed into the stomach and wire is passed through the needle. The percutaneous tract is dilated with fascial dilators. The PEG tube is then placed, confirmed in position with contrast injection, and secured with internal and external bolsters. Now, all PEG tubes are flexible rubber catheters with a feeding port secured by internal external bolsters. There are some bolster variations. Most PEG tubes are either a soft cupped internal bolster which can be pulled through the abdominal wall or an inflatable balloon. A minority of tubes have a rigid bolster that can only be removed endoscopically. The vast majority of replacement tubes will use balloon internal bolsters. When you talk about PEG versus PEG-J tubes, the feeding port of a PEG is expected to be in the stomach. In patients with a PEG-J tube, the catheter extension is into the jejunum with two external ports, one for the stomach and the one for the jejunum. And here's just a good example of a percutaneous gastrojejunostomy tube, the PEG-J. You can see the image on your left, a coronal MIP, showing the position PEG-J extending from bolster entry site through the stomach and duodenum with tip in the proximal jejunum, which is the blue arrow.
And the coronal images show the malposition peg. And here's another case extending from the red arrow with radiolucent segment of catheter followed by more distal radio opaque catheter coiling in the stomach with tip in the gastric antrum. So you can see the difference. With the uh, peg J, you need to follow it through the stomach, through the duodenum, and down into the jejunum. Obviously, if it's not positioned there, it's incorrectly placed. Now, there are some potential pitfalls. You want to be very careful that um, at times, if patients are, if there's motion in the patient, you can potentially uh, call um, fractured catheters. Uh, you want to make certain you look at both soft tissue and uh, lung windows to really understand where the catheter is. And especially if there's motion and the patient's obese, uh, it can be somewhat tricky at times, just a potential pitfall. Now, in terms of evaluating peg placement, fluoroscopy, typically the first line of confirmation of a peg two position following placement or dislodgement or replacement. It also may be able to identify a gastric leak if it's present. What you can do is put water-soluble contrast material through the peg under fluoroscopic guidance or with serial pre- and post-contrast x-rays. CT is used to evaluate for the more serious complications, such as potential abscesses, hemorrhage, injury to adjacent organs like the liver or colon, gastric perforation, or in cases where fluoroscopy or radiography does not answer the question. Now, in terms of CT protocols, Often PET complications are identified on CT exams presenting in patients who are, we are not thinking about PET complications. It's just simply abdominal pain. IV contrast should ideally be used in the setting of suspected infection or suspected visceral organ injury. If you're only looking for two placement, obviously a non-IV contrast study will work very well. If hemorrhage is suspected as a complication, uh, dual phase imaging with CT angio protocol is ideal for detecting the presence and site of bleeding. Oral contrast typically is not needed, but if you're looking for a leak or suspect a leak, then it can be very helpful. If used, uh, we want to use water soluble contrast material such as Omnipake in solution works very nicely. When you look at the complications of PEG tubes, you can divide them into early and late complications or what might be called anytime complications. Early on, pneumoperitoneum ileus, perforation, damage to adjacent organs or bleeding. Late complications typically are fistulous formation, breakdown of the gastrostomy site, buried bumper syndrome, or peg site hernia. Early or late, you can see occlusion or displacement, peristomal leakage, infection, bleeding, or obstruction. Now, in terms of the early complications, pneumoperitoneum is common post-peg placement and is of no consequence. Ileus, some patients will have transient gastroparesis or ileus. The ileus is felt to be more likely if there's large volume pneumoperitoneum. Perforation, be it esophagus or stomach, is a complication of any endoscopy and is a known complication. Again, if the peg tube is placed incorrectly, you can imagine why you might hit the colon, particularly with a high riding colon. Or if you have a liver where the edge of the liver comes way to the left, it can be problematic. And of course, bleeding. Anytime you're placing a catheter, you're doing a procedure, be it gastric or gastropapillic artery, varices, abdominal wall varices are all possibilities as site of bleeding. Here's a nice example of a case of a patient two days post plague pacement. Uh, the patient has a pneumoperitoneum. Again, typically that will resolve. The big question is, in the absence of perineal signs, can you go ahead and feed the patient? Typically, as long as you're comfortable, the tube's in place, the answer is yes. If the patient's symptomatic, perforated viscous is possible, and that's where CT is indeed very helpful. In this case, you see the PEG tube with bolster in correct position in the gastric body. Uh, the pneumoperitoneum by the liver uh, is just an incidental finding, and that will soon be gone. In this case, look at the PEG tube. It's in the left lobe of the liver. 
It's there's fluid around it. This is in the liver. So it's an abscess with gastrohepatic fistula. So this is indeed problematic. And you can see the fluoroscopy where the uh, contrast is going into the liver. This case shows an intragastric hematoma following a peg. That probably is not all that common, or rather, not that all that uncommon. You can see high density material again. Most of the time, the patients will do well without any intervention. Again, we'll look carefully, make sure there's no active bleed. That can indeed be more problematic. Uh, most of these patients will do extremely well. Here's another example of hematoma. This is perigastric. And again, particularly patients who have uh, are on Coumadin or any other bleeding type disorders, you can see very nicely here, patient was having pain a day post PEG-2 placement, and there's a large high-density collection between the stomach and the abdominal wall representing a hematoma. This patient did undergo emergent laparotomy with evacuation of the intragastric and perigastric hematoma. Now, we mentioned some of the other complications that can occur late or early from occlusion, which is not uncommon. Regular flushing helps prevent this. Tube displacement, peristomal leakage, infection, whether it's stomal or wound infection, or rarely a necrotizing fasciitis obviously bleeding or migration of the tube balloon or the bolster. And here's just a nice example uh, where you see a large collection within the abdominal wall, which literally tracks down all the way into the pelvis. Uh, you can see that this was not in the correct place. Uh, it's a tube feed, which literally is tracking within muscle and within the abdominal wall. Or this case where there's an extraluminal peg within the rectus muscle, and you can see the air within the muscle. Again, we see air in muscle, we always think infection or necrotizing fasciitis, but it may simply be that the tube is in the wrong place, and when the tube is flushed, you get air within muscle, and it's shown very nicely in this case. Or in this example, we see an extraluminal peg. The uh, CT shows the mouth position peg balloon outside the stomach, positioned adjacent to the transverse colon, and you can see why injury to the liver, I showed you a case, or injury to the colon is indeed very possible. In this patient, the peg balloon migrated and now is obstructing the GE junction. So usually it will migrate distally, but it can migrate proximally. Uh, patient symptoms improve with GI uh, repositioning of the peg, um, and again, this can lead to all sorts of complications. Now we mentioned late complications. Here we talk about things like breakdown of the gastrostomy tube site, infection, leak, bleeding, fistulous formation to the abdominal wall, to adjacent organs, a case reports of colocutaneous fistula due to placement of PEG through interposed colon on the way to the stomach have been reported, buried bumper syndrome, and PEG site hernia. And just a couple examples, here's the buried bumper syndrome. The long-term tight apposition of the peg bolsters may cause the internal bolster to erode the gastric wall. And at endoscopy, the bolster is buried in the gastric mucosa. This causes pain and feeding intolerance. CT may see the internal bolster bulging into the abdominal wall, shown very nicely in this example. Here's an example of a peg site hernia con containing gastric wall and the peg balloon. And again, this is a patient who's had a peg in for a long time. It's just simply wearing its way out anteriorly. Or in this case, where the patient has perforation with leakage into the peritoneal cavity, there's areas of necrosis, there's infection. You can see, look how bright the adrenals are. You can see the patient is hypotensive. At surgery, the patient was found to have gastric angial perforation at the gastroscopy site. Uh, again, the patient has not only a very bright adrenals, but very small celiac and SMA, showing that the patient is indeed hypotensive. Here's an example of migrated esophageal stents obstructing the peg. Um, patient had no luck at all. The patient's peg bolsters are budding and obstructed by the esophageal stents. 
which have now migrated into the stomach. So again, you want to look very carefully when you have stents in place. Again, look for complications between different uh, various things. And I listed a number of references that can be helpful. I bet most of you never heard of the buried bumper syndrome, and I bet most of you can't say that 10 times fast. But anyway, peg tubes are something we're seeing more of. It's used particularly in older populations, frail patients, and it's our job to detect complications, particularly when they're unsuspected. And hopefully this talk will help you do that better. So with that, see you tomorrow.